For criminal media's policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Activist and former judge at the Constitutional Court, Albi Sex, is in conversation with Polity about the book titled, I Know This To Be True. So what do you remember about growing up in Cape Town during the World War? I remember walking on the beach, uh, being told, your father is coming. And looking down, I was a little picky, and my parents were separated, and he had really white tackies on. And right high up was a voice, far away, kind of speaking to me. Uh, and that was my dad, Sorry, Sachs. Uh, my kind of first memories. And, and the war was something far away, but um, totally enveloping. People spoke about the war all the time. And, and soldiers went up north, it was called. My uncles went to fight up north, from South Africa up north. Uh, and Hitler was terrible. Uh, and, and there was bombing. And at one stage, I was at a kindergarten in Seapoint, and they moved the kindergarten to the interior because they were scared that there would be U-boats from Japan would come into the Seapoint area and start shelling the area. Uh, and we had to put up blinds on, on, the, on the windows in case there were going to be bombing raids. But that was like the closest that the war as war had. But the idea of a world out there where people were killing each other, uh, where men were expected to be brave and to kill and be killed, uh, played a very big role in my imagination. And we used to read stories that came from England about the brave fighters in, in the RAF planes shooting down the Messerschmitts uh, and, and that idea of being brave in war uh, was something that was just put strongly into our heads. Your mom used to work for the famous Moses Kotani. What do you remember about him? <laughs> well, he wasn't famous then. Uh, he was famous in my mind because he was my mother's boss. And she would say, tidy up, tidy up, Uncle Moses is coming. Uh, and, and I think I would hear the word communist sort of from time to time. Uh, didn't quite know what it meant but I understood he was the general secretary of the Communist Party of South Africa. It's a very big, big kind of title. But I remember him as Uncle Moses. He was very kind, very warm, uh, very um, um, friendly with my mother and very um, friendly towards me and my little brother. Uh, so he, he wasn't like uh, a general secretary big important person. And he would come in and smile and, and joke and so on. Um, and at the time, I didn't realize how unusual it was uh, it, being a white child in South Africa with your mother working for a black man and working for a man whom she admired and respected enormously. Uh, and looking back now, what a blessing it was for me to grow up in that world where that was the natural world and the world of apartheid was the unnatural world. Now take us through the day at the University of Cape Town uh, during a meeting when you wanted to join the black students who were, sign who were singing liberation songs, but your friends reminded you that you were white. Okay, it's not quite right. This wasn't on the campus. This was the 6th of April, 1952. I think for you, it's like as far back as the French Revolution used to be for me. Uh, and I was uh, 17, and uh, that date was important because it was 300 years since a certain young friend Rebic had landed in what became Cape Town and planted the Dutch East India Company flag. And we used to be taught at school when South African history started, when this white man came and planted his flag. And, and the regime was celebrating 300 years with the planes flying overhead and the armored cars through the streets. And there were maybe 200 of us in the Salt River Town Hall, working class area. And that's when the freedom songs were being sung. And the songs in those days were mainly very really sad songs. My boy, my boy, 
my boy africa come back africa and sends any now which is still sung today sends any now but suddenly Dr. Morocco, Dr. Dadu, J.B. Marx, Katani Labour Party, volunteers obey the orders. Be ready for the action now. Volunteers, and they're calling for volunteers. The beginning of the defiance of unjust laws campaign, and I want to volunteer. Take me, take me. And my friend says, you can't. Why not? You white. But we're fighting racism. This is a black struggle led by black people. But I'll tell the leadership, and that was now in April, in December, after I'd written my second year exams, I'm leading a group in the Defiance of Unjust Laws campaign, sitting down on seats in the General Post Office in Cape Town, marked non-whites only. And as a young advocate, what kind of cases did you handle at the time? So that's 17. I'm still a law student. And um, but three years later, I'm qualified as an advocate. Uh, and the first cases you get as a young advocate would be possible death sentence murder cases. Can you imagine? And the idea was nobody should be hanged if they didn't have representation. And these young advocates coming out of university must get some practice, trial experience. So we would practice in that sense on the lives, literally on the lives of, of our clients. So those would be some of the first cases. But very quickly, I started getting cases that came from Annie Selenga. She refused to carry a pass, and she's charged under Section 25 of Act of 1945, the Urban Native Urban Areas Act, of being a bunch of women in an urban area without a pass. And I would go into the Native Bantu Commissioner's Court and defend her. She never took a pass. She never took a pass. She put on trial for treason. She never took a pass. Uh, I'd have cases like that. And I would have cases of a trade union strike, black workers, unlawful strike, uh, people charged with breaking their banning orders. The government would issue orders restricting the movements where you could go. We went to attend the gatherings. Uh, I, I would also deal with cases like that. And then I had the ordinary cases that any young advocate had, divorce cases, uh, property cases. I even understood for one day how the internal combustion engine of a car worked. It had something to do with a garage hadn't done proper repairs. Uh, you did a little bit of everything as, as a young advocate. But half the cases were cases that were purely political. I never took a penny for them. I never took any money for them, which is my big secret, because the first rule of a young, of an advocate is thou shalt charge. Otherwise you're seen as undercutting. You're undercutting your colleagues if you, if you take a case for nothing. And that was my big secret, that half my work was work without pay. I defended ANC people. I probably defended more PAC people than ANC in the early 1960s, at Porco, uh, literally dozens and dozens and dozens of people. Uh, and even although many of them were hostile to the uh, ANC, uh, and they didn't like the idea of the ANC having white people like me in it, I was defending them uh, because they weren't being prosecuted because they didn't like people like me. They were being prosecuted because they were resisting apartheid. I even met Robert Sabukwe in one big case, the Philip Kosana trial, where he led a march of 25, 30,000 people from Lang and Yanga to the center of Cape Town. Uh, and, and although the PAC said no bail, no defense, no fine, three of the accused were ANC. They wanted me uh, as their lawyer. And then I worked very well with the PAC people and they asked, could we call Subukwe as a witness? And I flew to Johannesburg. I went to the jail where he was being held. There he was in short pants, this very, very dignified man. Uh, and he was willing to be a witness. It must have been hard at times when, when your clients, like the, the two that you spoke about in the book, were sentenced to death. Tell us about that. Capital punishment was so terrible uh, and and one of the first things you, you, 
you learned was it's not the crime that mattered. It was a, a black person killing a black person, a white person killing a black person, a white person killing a white person, no death sentence. A black person killing a white person, death sentence. That was the number one issue. Number two issue was who was the judge? We had a judge, Herbstein, in Cape Town. He never passed a death sentence. He always found some reason not to. We had another judge, Latakhan, would do six in one year. So that your client's life depended on these factors that had nothing to do with guilt or innocence. Uh, and the strain, the pressure was, was just awful on, on everybody concerned. Uh, so these would be cases where most of them were not political cases, but uh, the idea of a rope being put down down the person's neck, cold-blooded being hanged, we, we just came to be horrified at that, at that idea. And my whole generation became opposed to capital punishment. I had colleagues who found it was nothing. For them it was nothing. Too bad. They brought it on themselves. They didn't care at all. We, we, we loathed capital punishment. And now, do you remember how it felt when you met, for the first time, Henry van der Westhuizen, the man who organized that terrible car bomb for the, while you were in Maputo? So now I'm Judge Albi Sachs, sitting in my chambers. You people have an office. We judges have chambers. And I wasn't wearing my gown because I wasn't going into court. The phone rings at reception, tells me there's a man. Called Henry, he says he has an appointment to meet you. And I said, send him through. And I go to the security gate. My heart is going boom, 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 boom. He'd phoned me to say he had organized the bomb in my car. He's going to the Truth Commission. Uh, am I willing to meet him? And I open the door. And I see this man. He's tall and thin like me, younger than me. And he's looking at me. I'm looking at him. And I see in his eyes, so this is the man I tried to kill. And he must see in my eyes, this is the man who tried to kill me. We didn't even know each other. We didn't fight over love, money, power. But he was on that side, I was on this side. And he tried to kill me. And we walk to my chambers, and he's striding like a soldier. And I try my best judge's ambulation to slow him down. And we sit down, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. He tells me about his family and his parents. And, and he was a good student. Uh, and he's so proud. He rose up through the ranks in the army, in the hit squad. He expects me to pat him on the back to say congratulations, Henry, for being such a good killer. And then he tells me about the planting of the bomb in my car. And they postponed it. And he was taken off the case. And when I was blown up afterwards, he realized uh, he, he'd been responsible. And at the end, I said, Henry, uh, I've got to get on with my work. I, we stood up. And I said, normally when I say goodbye to someone, I shake that person's hand. I can't shake your hand. But go to the Truth Commission. Tell them what you know. Maybe we'll meet one day. And I remember as we walked back, he's not striding like a soldier. He's going along, almost creeping along, and he goes, and I forget about him. But six, seven, eight months later, I'm attending a party. It's organized by Issy Dingo. Remember Issy Dingo? Filmmakers. And it's late in the year. I'm tired. I'm with my friend. And the music is very loud. And people are enjoying themselves. And I hear a voice says, Albie. And I look around. Albie, I can't believe it. It's Henry calling me by my first name. And he's got a huge smile on his face. And, and, we get into a corner where the band is not so, so loud. And he said, and I went to the Truth Commission and I met Bobby and Sue and Farouk, three people who've been in exile with me, who also could have been victims of the bomb. I told them everything I knew and you said that one day, and I checked him, one day maybe we'll meet, who knows? And I put out my hand, I shook his hand. He went away, Benny, I almost fainted. But I heard afterwards, but he left the party suddenly, went home, and he cried for two weeks. I don't know if it's true. 
I like to believe it's true. I'm not even checking up to find out because maybe it's not true. It's more important that it's true, that even possible. He's not my friend. If I'm sitting in a bus and he sits next to me, I'll ask him, how are you getting on? We won't go to a movie together. Somehow, because he went to the Truth Commission and he told the truth, I feel we're beginning to live in the same country. A bit of that mysterious darkness from the past of enemies has been enlightened. Uh, so now Henry pays the price. I take him around the world in my storytelling. He went on film explaining his side of the whole thing. That's the kind of a price that he's paying. But afterwards, when I'm after the bomb and I'm recovering in London Hospital, I'm blown up in the pooch, lost my arm, I get a note in a letter. You won't know letters. Letters, we used to lick the stamps on the envelopes. And I open it with my one hand and I take out and says, don't worry, comrade Albie, we will avenge you. I think avenge me. We're going to cut off the arm. We're going to blind in one eye the people that did this. Is that the country we want? And I say to myself, if we get freedom, if we get democracy, that will be my soft vengeance. Roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. And that theme of soft vengeance became the theme of my life after that. We don't do to them what they've done to us. Then we like them, only we are stronger. You transcend what they're doing. And you carry forward the ideals that got you into that situation. And coming back to South Africa, working on writing the new constitution, part of my soft vengeance. Voting as an equal, my soft vengeance. Getting onto the constitutional court, my soft vengeance. Being part of this project to bring justice to all, soft vengeance. Helping, promoting the idea of building the court on the site of the old Fort Prison, where both Gandhi, Mandela, Chief Lutuli, Robert Sabukwe, Winnie Mandela had all been locked up there. Soft vengeance. Writing judgments about the rights of the people, my colleagues. Soft vengeance. And that became, in that sense, the theme of my life. I won't say thank you, Henry, for giving me the theme of soft vengeance. But I do acknowledge that there's a way of turning the swords into plowshares, uh, the spears into pruning hooks, the negative into the positive, uh, which was the only way that South Africa could turn itself around. And mm -hmm. it's been a marvelous project for me, I'll be sex to be part of that project. Mm. Which takes me to the next question, because at the hospital, when you were told about the accident, instead of being traumatized, you were rather triumphant. And you even have a joke of Amy Cohen. Can you briefly share that joke with us? Okay, so this is going back now. It's the 6th of April, 1988. It's the Dia de Mulher Mozambicana, the day of the Mozambican woman a public holiday and I'm going down to the beach in the morning meetings in the afternoon and suddenly total darkness and something terrible is happening to me I don't know what it is and I hear a voice in the darkness saying Albi this is Eva Garrido you're in the Maputo Central Hospital your arm is in a lamentable condition. You must face the future with courage. And I say to the darkness, what happened? And I hear a voice, a woman's voice saying, it was a car bomb. A car bomb? I'm in the hands of Frelimo. I'm safe. I haven't been kidnapped. I'm not being thrown into South African jail. And I feel exhilarated. That moment every freedom fighter is waiting for, will they come for me? Will they come for me today? Will I be brave? Will I get through? They'd come for me. They'd try to kill me and I'd survive. And I had a total conviction that as I got better, my country would get better. And you also share that Oliver Tambo 
had a huge influence on you while you were you, you were in exile. You even helped him to prepare that speech that he delivered at a religious conference in London, which you say was central uh, why you were part of writing uh, the constitution. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, you know, I grew up in Cape Town. I was in the struggle in Cape Town. I was at university in Cape Town. I was in jail in Cape Town. And O.R. Tambo was in Johannesburg, and Nelson Mandela was in Johannesburg. I used to go when, during the school, the university breaks, I would visit the office of, of uh, Mandela and Tambo, young, white, would-be lawyer. Uh, and they were always very kind to me, offered me a cup of tea, it would be Ruth Mampati, and they'd say, we're very, very busy here. And I appreciated the embrace. It was like saying, Comrade Alby, you are welcome in our struggle. Years passed, and then I end up in Mozambique, and I still had two arms then. Uh, and I'm invited by Oliver Tambo to come to the soccer to deal with what the ANC should do with captured enemy agents. Because our people were beating them up were beating them up and he didn't like that. We don't beat them up, they beat us up, but we're not like them. So I worked with him, his instructions on a code of conduct, no torture inside the ANC. Then one day I get a message, can I help him with one of his speeches? Now people were terrified of working on OR speeches. He was so particular. He would go over and over and over again. But I didn't have that experience with him. And it was an interesting speech because he was going to London to address an international conference of religious leaders. Now, O.R. had been about to become ordained as an Anglican priest or minister in December 1956. He was going to be ordained and marry Adelaide in the month of December. The regime had other plans. They locked him up for high treason, put him in jail in the old fort prison. We got a choir going immediately and didn't become an Anglican priest, but he never lost his faith. And he's now going to this conference. Now, I grew up in a very secular home, non-religious home, but he didn't ask people from religious desk to help him. They would have said, we know this Catholic priest and we know that Methodist and so on. They would have seen it in very secular terms. He asked me, the secular Albi, to help him with the spiritual side. We met just so beautifully. He framed it in his religious language. I had the same concept, but I might express them in a different way. And it was very lovely working with him and to feel that strong bond and connection and to feel I belong to a movement where people can bring in their ideals, their beliefs, and share them. You don't give up your ideals and beliefs because somebody else has ideals and beliefs. You share it with the others. So it was very, very special working with them. Uh, when years later, I was elected to the NEC of the ANC at the conference in, in, in UDW uh, Sports Hall in, in, in Durban, uh, this was now 1991, uh, he had had a stroke and he'd lost the use of his right arm. I'd been blown up, I'd lost most of my right arm. And it's about two in the morning, uh, they called the name of L.B. Sachs, I was number 25 on the list of the NEC members. And I woke up and I'm waving my arm and everybody's cheering and I get onto the platform and he leans over but he can't lean with his right arm to greet me and I can't go with my right arm and I put my left hand forward to reach me. And he actually took my hand to his lips as though he was like blessing me. It was a very personal, very intimate, very special moment that we had from completely different backgrounds and yet meeting at that level of, of soul, of deep inner belief and idealism. Very, very special for me. And lastly, what would you say to South Africans feeling discouraged as the world is fighting the deadly coronavirus pandemic? We've got through worse and come out stronger. 
uh, growing up in World War II, which was such a calamity for humanity, uh, producing the United Nations afterwards, getting decolonization, getting rights for women, getting rights for gay and lesbian people. Uh, the world has advanced. We got through all that and we brought down apartheid in South Africa. But we also had a terrible period of AIDS denialism in this country where thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were dying because we didn't know how to respond to HIV AIDS. And we found the way and pleased to say the court played an important role in guaranteeing access to antiretrovirals. And now we don't even remember that terrible weight, how we were being crushed by HIV. It seemed it was going to take away everything from this country. There was no hope left. And now we have the biggest antiretroviral program in the world. We're going to get vaccines. And there's such a heavy push. The vaccines must be available for everybody, not the property of the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and we are finding tremendous bonds being created between South Africans aware of the inequalities in this country, the injustice in our country being highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So I believe uh, in, in, in the good coming out of the bad, the negative being turned into the positive. Uh, and I'm hoping that we will come through this and we'll come through stronger. We will face up to the problems in the country more effectively than we've dealt with the problems of independence of democracy in the past. That was activist and former judge Albi Sex speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book titled I Know This To Be True.